Hi, I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. You know, we spend a lot of time talking about object storage. It's really growing in interest throughout the industry. So I thought it would be really helpful to talk about some of the use cases uh, for object storage and where it makes a lot of sense. So joining me on the whiteboard is Paul Wisenberg. He is the product manager at uh, Western Digital. Thanks yep. for joining us, Paul. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So what do you got drawn up here? So um, I'm kind of going to show a little bit about the architecture of okay. how ActiveScale um, is, is deployed, how it works, and some of the pain points that we're going to solve for customers with active um, workloads on, that require object storage. And, and you're using the word active specifically. I'm assuming that you're trying to not talk about sort of like the cold uh, ex file use ex cases. Exactly. We talk to customers, we find more and more that customers need to get value from their data. Okay. Sitting it on an object storage, letting it rot away. It's, it's not giving them any value, it's not giving them any benefit. So when we talk to customers in many different um, verticals, it's, it's, it's all about how do I get value from my data. And I think that's very intriguing because I think, like you said, I think a lot of people sort of mentally think of object storage as sort of the digital dumping ground. Mm -hmm. And so being able to actively use that is uh, really important. So before we jump into the use cases, what are some of the pain points that you guys are seeing? Right, when we when we talk to our customers, there are three that really jump out. So okay. First, first, there's accessibility of the data. How do I make sure that when I need to use the data, it's readily available? Okay. Second, performance. Obviously, some customers with very specific workloads need very performant systems. And some options that they have in object storage today don't really provide that level of performance. Okay. And then, of course, cost, right? That's across the board, no sure. matter the vertical. It's, right. it's an important topic. Yeah, price is always an issue, right? Always, always a topic. Okay. Yeah. So let's maybe talk about the accessibility first. Sure, let's do it. Okay. So I've kind of drawn up here um, the, the basic architecture for an active scale system. So a very initially, if we just kind of talk about San Francisco here, the, 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 the architecture is such that we have two different tiers. We have an access tier and a storage tier. Okay. Right? So all the customer data will be through three different systems on the access tier, and then six different systems on the storage tier will actually hold the data at to 19 nines of durability. When a customer with the client, as S3, NFS, decides to write into the, uh, the, the, uh, the active scale object store, um, the data is immediately consistent so that when as soon as it hits uh, the storage tier, lands, I can read that data out of any other system node in that tier. Okay. And so that, that, that architecture, I would assume, helps performance because you're kind of dividing up the I.O. Yes, exactly. So not only does as the data traverses, let's say, the data traverses into a system node, the system node can then redirect that to its storage counterparts yep. where the erasure encoding happens, and then we will dynamically place that data on some number of disks in our system. So that gives you data reliability as exactly. well. Exactly, and okay. as, as soon as that act goes back to the client, the data is going to be available to read through any other medium. So then, uh, you have S3 and NFS written up there on the board. I'm assuming that means I can use either protocol to uh, write and read. You absolutely can. So okay. we, we support both protocols. They're both handled in this um, high performant um, system access tier, um, and then the underlying storage is the same. Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. so that helps us when we actually want to be able to scale out too. Western Digital has two different platforms, our X100 platform and our P100 platform, different uh, densities, uh, different kind of use cases that we support, but the architecture is the same. In both cases, we can actually continue to scale out the system independently of our access tier, okay. so that we can say, oh look, I can uh, store additional data here. The performance remains the same. When I'm now writing into objects, we'll go to another um, uh, domain. So these storage columns are effectively data protection domains. So all the erasure coding, data repair, constant verification, all this happening within this localized system. Okay. So from a performance perspective, that helps us do two things. Uh, one, it helps us make sure that when something does go wrong, and unfortunately things will go wrong, sure. um, the impact may be minimized. So if I lose a disk, and I have to do some repair of data, I don't have to impact anything that's happening on one of our other Yeah, you, you kind of created like a failure domain. Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. And the other thing is it's minimizing our east-west traffic. So we okay. can really oh, focus yeah. on performance right out to NFS and, and S3 clients. That's a good point. You don't end up with an overly complex network. Absolutely, uh, in that it really limits the complexity and also limits from a customer perspective, how do I scale out and how do I size my system? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, good. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, from a uh, also from the performance standpoint, uh, one of the things that we'll actually do is um, be able to scale out our system node tier independently as well. So we can 
scale that out as well. So if I need additional bandwidth for, say, large objects, if I'm doing big video files, uh, if I have um, large uh, DNA sequences that I need to do post-processing of, I need to get those in and out, right? I mean, this is all about getting value sure. of your data. So if I can't get the data out to go do things with it, and so, so it's a really a very flexible architecture in allowing that. So it seems like that I can scale both of those components uh, independently, right? So Correct. depending on my use case, if I, if because a lot of people tend to be very bandwidth heavy or they're very capacity heavy, not yeah. necessarily always both. Correct. So the fact that these are dis, dis, uh, decoupled allows me to scale independently. We, we find it, we find a solution that really works for the customer. Perfect. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. really smart. So then again, from an accessibility standpoint. You see, I've actually got drawn a couple of other data centers here. Sure. Right? So I've got San Francisco, Las Vegas, and Los Angeles. So from the accessibility, the customer can really decide, how do I want to configure the deployment? Okay. Right? So a couple options. I can say, well, I want to have an active scale deployment here in San Francisco, um, and my clients are in San Francisco. Uh, data durability across data centers, geographies isn't important to me. But if it is, we can actually stitch these threes together as a consistent durability domain themselves. Huh, okay. So if I write an object, that object will be written into the system node tier, and then we'll actually start writing that data in real time consistently to other data centers as well. So okay. as soon as we acknowledge that write back to the client, you can lose a data center if, I mean, hopefully that would never happen, but if you could do it in- Could be an earthquake in San Francisco. Exactly, right? yeah. So then, so that does that give me both uh, like a data distribution model as well as disaster recovery, or is it mostly for disaster recovery? It's, it's, for, it's for both. So, okay. um, so if I have uh, client access, right? So if, if, say, like I have these clients that are in San Francisco, but I have other clients that need to read and write out of Los Angeles, the fact that we've Move the data. Or we've moved the data in, in all these different places, and not necessarily moved, it's actually that the data will exist in all three data centers. I can read, write all of that data consistently out of any data center so I can just spread my, you know, my clients that I need to be able to access the data wherever I need them to be. Okay, so, so we've talked about uh, access and performance. Obviously, I think you've kind of nailed those pretty well. Yep. Let's talk about the other big one, price. How do you guys help with uh, people meeting the, the price commitments they need to meet? Right, right, so um, Western Digital is traditionally a device company. That's what people think of. We're trying to change that paradigm. We're trying to make them think about the systems as well. As being part of Western Digital, we can provide value to customers that other vendors can't, um, both with our relationship with the drive um, organizations within our own company, being able to do things with the drives uh, to keep them online, to make sure that we reduce the, um, the, uh, the number of, like say, replacements that you would need to make during mm -hmm. the course of a year. Um, being able to set certain characteristics of the drive within our system uh, so that really reduces the total operating expenditures that the customer has to, 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 to spend. So, so I would assume that means you can kind of get inside information as far as uh, different things about the drives to make sure. We know things that, that no other vendor can do um, okay. that offer, allows us to offer uh, value that uh, no, other, no other vendor can. Okay, great. Yeah. So obviously one of the things that uh, object storage is known for and, and sure. not certainly the use cases you've talked about, mm -hmm. uh, really expect a, a lot of data durability and, and long-term retention. How do you guys help with that? Sure. Um, so we really want to, this to be the last object storage platform that our customers have to, have to deploy. Okay. Uh, the architecture really helps facilitate that. So first we have our bit dynamics, which is our erasure encoding. Um, with our erasure encoding, we can support up to 19 nines of durability, which is is, is a lot. Really good. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, of course, with this architecture, we see how we have these individual storage columns. As the size of our drives grow, as the the you know media changes over over time, we're well equipped to be able to build a heterogeneous architecture here, right, where we can take advantage of new technologies that they come forward. Yeah, you know, that's a really good point because I could, I guess, with each of these stacks, I can switch. The the drive technology and you guys just keep it's right on going. Exactly, ah, from a customer really standpoint, you'll never know. Yeah, from a from a customer standpoint, it's completely transparent to them. They'll, they'll know that they have a, a lot of, of really durable storage underneath, but what's actually existing underneath is all managed centrally by us. So that's really going to help with the ease of use of, of from a customer standpoint. A heterogeneous storage underneath will allow us to, to, to build and help facilitate customers for their futures. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for joining us hey, today. Thank you so much. So there you have it. If you're looking for object storage and you're looking for the, the kind of more active use case to derive more value from the system, this is an ideal architecture to consider and also meet those long-term uh, sort of data forever uh, needs that we're starting to see more and more uh, organizations require. I'm George Crump, lead analyst with Storage Switzerland. Thank you for joining us.